Hillstead Museum in Farmington, Connecticut is a place where art and nature flourish together, just as the family that designed this estate intended. Hillstead is a colonial revival house built at the turn of the 20th century and maintained today just as it was when the family that built it lived here. Hillstead is their outstanding art collection. Hillstead is 150 acres of fields, trails, and scenic views. Hillstead is May Market and other seasonal events for the whole family. Hillstead is also a beautiful sunken garden, the site of the annual Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. This program and the ones that follow are an invitation to you to attend this summer's series of poetry and music events. Welcome to Hillstead Museum. If you are a poetry lover or just appreciate an evening of the arts in a beautiful setting, come to Hillstead Museum this summer for the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. Beginning on June 24th, the festival offers poetry and music on three Wednesday evenings and two Sunday afternoons all summer long. People love the informality and outdoor setting of this festival. You can bring lawn chairs or blankets, pack a picnic, or buy dinner and wine from the vendors here. There's an hour of live music first, anything from jazz to folk to classical, and then you can hear some of the best poets in the country read poetry that is relevant and accessible. The festival's ongoing popularity is evidence that poetry still holds an important place in American culture and that poetry has a unique power to remind us of our own common humanity. For this series of programs, we have picked readings from the summer of 2014. Hillstead welcomes the following headlining poets to the 2015 Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. On June 24th, Ted Couser. On July 12th, Marie Howe. On July 22nd, Vijay Sashadri. On August 9th, Lee Young Lee as part of Outspoken, a celebration of Asian poetry. And on August 19th, Natalie Diaz as a part of Connecticut Young Poets Day. We've had a remarkable season um, here in the garden with headlining poets such as Kevin Young, Frank Bedart, Alicia O. Stryker, Jeffrey Harrison, and now tonight, Amy Nezuku Matato. I am so pleased you're here tonight to celebrate um, not only the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival, but also our Connecticut Young Poets Day. And, um, and if you missed them, the uh, Fresh Voices Poetry Competition Award winners, you can pick up a copy of their chapbook published by Antrim House Press uh, just at the top of the garden at the museum welcome table. Now, in just a moment, Ravi Shankar is going to take the podium, and he is going to introduce Amy. Uh, Ravi is an award-winning poet himself and also a professor at Central Connecticut State University as well as the chairman of the Connecticut Writers' Trust and a faculty member of the first international MFA program at the City University of Hong Kong. And I um, know that he's just done a little traveling over there. Ravi is also the founding editor and the executive director of the International Online Journal of the Arts, Drunken Boat. Ravi has been an integral part of our Poetry Advisory Committee, which was new this year, and he just um, this afternoon, emceed an hour of student poetry in our makeshift theater, um, highlighting students from organizations across the state, including the Connecticut Writers Trust. Please join me in welcoming Ravi Shankar to the podium. Hello, everyone. What a glorious evening for poetry. Um, welcome to the final sunken garden of the season. I'm just so glad to be here with you in this beautiful space. And um, let's get a, a big round of applause to Susan, Amanda, all the staff and volunteers who've made this happen. I've seen them working assiduously behind the scene. And I want to encourage all of you who've enjoyed uh, tonight and the entire season uh, of music and poetry to spread the words, tell your friends and neighbors how great this is, as we depend on all of your support to keep this festival, which is the longest running in Connecticut, going forward. 
Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Amy Nezukuma Tatil. I just heard her speaking with the student winners. She ran a workshop for them, and she connected so intimately and fluently with them. And she also prefaced her workshop by telling folks not to be intimidated by her name. So, because it actually follows the cadence of the Lion King's Hakuna Matata. So, Amy Nezukuma Matato. Although I've always known her as Amy Nez. So I, I think you could probably call her that if you wanted. Um, she's a professor of English at the State University of New York in Fredonia. Uh, she teaches creative writing and environmental literature and has a number of honors, including a poetry fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, a uh, Pushcart Prize, and she's the author of three collections of poetry, including Lucky Fish, which won the gold medal in poetry from the Independent Publishers Book Awards and the Eric Hoffer Grand Prize for Independent Books uh, at the Drive-In Volcano. Uh, winner of the Balcones Prize and Miracle Fruit, her first book, which was winner of the Tupelo Press Prize, which uh, all three books, I believe, are on sale with R.J. Julia up above. And really, that's the word that I keep coming back to when I think of Amy and her work, a vast openness. Amy Nez's poems are those most wondrous of hybrid creations. She experiments with forms, writes epistolary poems, highboon, guzzles, even poems based on multiple choice exams, but always infuses them with a signature wit and a palpable sensuality that draws from her bicultural background, but deepens into an utterance at once quirky and universal. The most important thing, I think, is that when I read one of Amy's poems, I almost always smile, sometimes even in spite of myself. She's unafraid to write about motherhood, about the natural world, including mud and its confusions, and about the vast organic tapestry of perceptions and emotions that unfurled before us as a blossom to pick and to puzzle over. She's one of the finest poets of her generation, and I'm certain that tonight she will also make you smile. So it's with great joy that I introduce Amy Nezukumatato to you now. Let's please have a warm sunken garden welcome to her. Amy. Oh my goodness, this has been, I've been telling um, Amanda and Susan, this has been one of my dream venues to read uh, for the past two years. So when I got the invitation, I was so beyond thrilled. I'm so honored to be here. Um, thank you to the Hillstead Museum for inviting me. Um, this has got to be one of the most lovely places to read, I think, in the country. So. Um, I'm especially um, just so honored to be reading here in front of Governor Malloy and his wife, and thank you so much for supporting the arts. And I know today there's a lot of students in the audience, lots of parents and teachers as well, and I wanted to give a special shout out to you all. This reading is for you guys especially. Um, and uh, I, I'm just so amazed. When I was in high, I didn't even know there were living poets when I was in high school. So, <laughs> sadly, I know. Um, I didn't even know there was living poets until late in my college career. So those of you who are encouraging young poets, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Ravi, what an amazing introduction. Thank you. Um, as, as Ravi had mentioned, my father is from um, South India, uh, Kerala to be exact. And my mother, he met my mother, they were working at the same hospital in Chicago, of all places, and uh, their first date was uh, the last time Elvis Presley played Chicago um, in the early, early 70s. Um, my, so my father was a big Elvis fan in India, watching all his movies. My mom was a big Elvis fan in India, and um, they broke tradition. Uh, this was the first non-arranged marriage in the Nizuka Matatil dynasty for 400-something years, uh, and they eloped, and I'm the product standing before you now. Um, when I told them that I wanted to not follow in their footsteps after all, and this has been years of, of, of kind of, you know, being trotted out at dinner parties and when they'd ask, what do you want to be, you know, Amy, I'd say, a doctor, just like mom. Um, and when I finally sat down, my parents, my junior year in college, junior year in college, and said, Mm -mm. I'm not taking the MCATs, I'm not going to go through with pre-med. Um, 
there was some... It was difficult, let's put it that way. It was a very difficult time in our household. There was a weeping, my stoic father, who I, I barely ever have seen cry, uh, was a weeping. Um, I could laugh about it now, but uh, I think they really sincerely thought that I was going to be homeless, um, shaking for coins, uh, that I'll write a haiku for them, for anybody on a street corner or something. Um, and so, and now, I, I laugh now because they're, they're my biggest supporters of poetry. Um, and I wanted to, when I got the job at SUNY Fredonia, I wanted to kind of say thank you for finally, you know, supporting me, even though they had no idea what poetry really was, and um, they didn't know that you could be a poet um, either. And I wanted to take them to New York City as a thank you, you know, for all their support. And they wanted to, they wanted to have this, soup that is, it's basically illegal to serve it anywhere in the country, um, but of course you can find it in New York City, right? Um, of course. And uh, the reason why it's illegal is that um, if it's prepared improperly, you will die. So, so, you, so here I am, I'm trying to thank my parents. They signed away their life on a, um, on a certificate that said that they're not going to sue the restaurant. It was very, very bizarre. Um, and uh, the Japanese have a proverb about this particular soup, and it goes, uh, the pro proverb goes something like, um, those who eat fugu soup are so stupid, but those who don't eat fugu soup are even more stupid. <laughs> this is the fugu soup blues. <laughs> Nothing good can come out of eating something named porcupine fish. It's like playing Russian roulette when you cook it. The pulse of toxin in its sweet little body can kill 30 men. But this is the most delicious of all fishes. The sweet meat almost sugared and the salty broth mix. Man, it's worth almost any death. Can you taste the pure poison hidden in the skin folds? Can you forget what you eat may kill you even as you wipe your, as, even as you wipe your mouth with the back of your hand? Consider the way the porcupine fish dies. It is the only fish that can close its eyes. When a cleaver comes near its head, it even winces. Sushi chefs complain of the noise it makes on the chopping block, like crying, even though fishermen always try to stitch its small mouth shut. And the blinking, don't we expect fish eyes to be dead black and dumb? You cannot stop this hunger. When something this good can kill you, every pinprick of white pain just adds more flavor. When the waiter with the curvy smile asks if you want seconds, please, please, I beg of you, set down your spoon. Uh, I wish I could go back to that pediatrician um, in Chicago who told my parents, do not, do not by any means teach your daughter anything but English. Because, and this is a direct quote, you don't want her to have any funny accents like you, right? Oh, and I'm just, I'm so frustrated because um, those of you who know the languages of Tagalog or Malayalam, um, from India, they're so beautiful. I w and so no, I don't know either of those languages. Um, but I do know some words, and this is called swear words. <laughs> Even now I laugh when I see the look on my mother's face when I swear in Tagalog. I have no idea what these phrases really mean but they've been spattered on me since I was still a fat, bawling baby and scattered onto my head when I've toppled juice glasses on white carpet or come home past curfew. Sometimes even the length of my skirts or driving her through a red light produces these words with a bit of a gasp, a wet sigh of disapproval. Now I catch myself saying them out loud when I knock my knee against the coffee table or slice a bit of my knuckle with paper. When I asked her, she told me one phrase meant God, so of course I felt guilty. And another is crazy female lost piglet, 
which doesn't even make sense when I think of the times I've heard her use that, and still others she claims are untranslatable. But the one I love best, Diablo, pronounced Jablu, the devil. She uses it as if to tell me, Jablu, I give up. You do what you want, but don't come running to me. After I tell her I bounced a check or messed up a romance with a boy she finally approved of. Jablu, Jablu. Here comes a little red devil running past the terracotta flower pots outside my mother's sunroom, tiny pitchfork in hand. Jablu, Jablu. Here's another devil from behind the kitchen curtains, a bit damp from the day's splashes of the sink. Today when they meet, they dance a silly jig on the countertop, knock over the canister of flour, and leave little footprints all over the place. <laughs> so I think, I think this crowd, um, knows that I love, by the way, can I just say, I love that so many people here are drinking. I love every poetry reading should have these goblets of wine. This is fantastic. Drink up, drink up, drink up. I just had to say that. So, um, what was I going to say now? Um, I was hearing clinks of, of uh, glasses and stuff. I love it. Anyway, um, I think this crowd will know this, um, this TV show. So oftentimes I go and visit high schools or colleges around the country, and it's so sad, um, especially in high schools, the students look at me like they have no idea what I'm talking about, but I think you guys know back in the 80s, there used to be a TV drama, not a cartoon, not the CGI, but a TV drama called The Incredible Hulk. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes, okay, good, good. The high schoolers think I'm completely making this up because they cannot fathom that there was an Emmy-nominated um, actor and it was a serious kind of, you know, drama. It wasn't a cartoon, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I always joke, it's the, it's the saddest theme song I think of any theme song in the history of television. Hang on one second. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google it, but here you go, let's see. So my students are like, no way was there ever a TV show of the Incredible Hulk. So you guys know this, all right. So um, in the 80s, I'm dating myself now, um, the, the biggest kind of teen idols were Kirk Cameron, um, Ricky Schroeder, Menudo, you know, things like that. Mine was a little bit different. I had a big crush on Bill Bixby um, from this. So that was a little different. Um, and this poem is called What I Learned from the Incredible Hulk. When it comes to clothes, make an allowance for the unexpected. <laughs> Be sure the spare in the trunk of your station wagon with wood paneling isn't in need of repair. A simple jean jacket says, hey, if you aren't trying to smuggle rare Incan coins through this peaceful little town and kidnap the local orphan, I can be one heck of a mellow kind of guy. <laughs> I learned that no matter how angry a man gets, a smile and a soft stroke on his bicep can work wonders. <laughs> I learned that male chests also have nipples, warm and established, and I know, that, I know now that green doesn't always mean envy. It's the meadows full of clover and chicory that the Hulk seeks for rest, a return to normal. And sometimes, sometimes a woman gets to go with him, her tiny hands correcting her his rumpled hair, the cuts in his hand. I learned that green is the space between water and sun. It's the cover for a quiet man, each of his ribs shuttling drops of liquid light. <laughs> Um, this is a, this is a poem, there's a, there's a, a flower, 
Uh, maybe some of you have seen it here. I'm not sure if one has ever bloomed in Connecticut now that I think about it, but um, there's a flower. It's my favorite flower in the world. It's the largest flower on the planet. It's called the corpse flower. Do any of you know this? Has one bloomed in Connecticut? Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. One is about to bloom in my home city, Buffalo, New York, any day now. And I, I'm like, I know, watch, it's going to bloom right when I'm here in Connecticut. Um, I've been researching this flower um, for over a decade now. Um, those of you who are theater buffs know that um, Little Shop of Horrors is based on this flower. Um, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, look up corpse flower in Buffalo. It's about to bloom any minute now. So, um, And this, you know, I mentioned to you, my parents are in the medical professions, but I still always count them as the first poets that I ever heard. Um, we barely had any literature in our house. It was always medical books and journals and kind of creepy magazines about the body. Um, but they would tell me these wonderful, wild stories of their childhood or um, folk tales from their countries. And um, this is like kind of a sampling of what they, uh, what my mother used to tell me about um, the corpse flower, which I thought was fake until I actually realized, no, she was actually kind of telling the truth here. This is the corpse flower. And when the farmer saw the giant flower with a smell like bad fish and bad sugar, he could not look away. The purple skirt of the bloom begged him to return. And so he did with a pail of water and he sang to it and he caressed it and swiped beetles away from the blossom's lip. He gave it a name and when the farmer said the name out loud, the flower began to move, and then it completely devoured him. Villagers searched and searched. That's not funny. That's not funny at all. That's creepy. What's wrong? It's the wine, right? You guys are drinking. <laughs> Villagers searched and searched for the farmer. When they too stumbled upon the large blossom, they decided to name it after a beautiful jaguar that once killed several children. Several children. But this flower does not want to be named. It does not want to be owned. When the flower heard this new name, it stretched to the closest person and ate her. Ate the name as well. You guys are like, ha ha ha, this flower eats people. <laughs> Don't blame me if you have nightmares tonight. All right, a little change of pace. Um, Ravi had mentioned, you know, that I, that I tend to kind of look at um, kind of the lighter side of things or trying to find the beauty in places. And um, some of the newer work that I'm, I'm delving into now is kind of the opposite of that, the darker parts of nature and um, humanity. Um, this is a one, part of a new series of poems I'm working on about um, various girls who've been kidnapped in India. Um, and I think, you know, I think, you know, maybe because they're half a world away, it's out of sight, out of mind. But I, I kind of wanted to, I don't know, I wanted to write these poems to let them know that they're not being forgotten um, as well. And this is called Two Moths. Some girls on the other side of this planet will never know the loveliness of walking in a crepe silk sari. Instead, they will spend their days on their backs for a parade of men who could be their uncles in another life. These girls memorize each slight, slight wobble of fan blade as it cuts through the stale tea air and auto rickshaw exhaust, thick, thick as egg curry. Men shove greasy rupees at the door for one hour in a room with a 12-year-old. One hour. One hour. And if she cries afterwards, her older sister will cover it up. Will rim the waterline of her eyes with coal pencil until it looks like two silk moths have stopped to rest for a brief moment on her still exquisite face. I do a lot of research in my poems um, 
mainly about the, the science world, the natural world, that kind of thing. Um, but this poem, actually, I had to do the, some of the longest research on, and it was about the subject, the bewildering subject for me, of baseball. Um, I wanted to get the terminology exactly right. I don't, that's the only sport I don't really watch, but my husband is a baseball coach, my boys are in Little League, so I had to get it right or they will never let me forget it. Anyway, this, is a, this has a slight nod to um, a Billy Collins poem called Litany, and this is called Come Home, Come Home. I am the girl in the outfield. I'm the one allergic to grass. I am the girl in the outfield. I sit along the third baseline and squint for the pinstripe of your pants, my tiny reflection in your sunglasses. I know if the ball pops my way, I will gladly throw my body over our baby. My clap will be the loudest of all the painted wives. I am the girl in the outfield. I'll be here through the night while you practice your pitch. When you tamp each base bag with your metal cleats, I am the puff of d and sand. I am the knock of wing against each street lamp. I am the girl in the outfield. And you are the slam and the run. Or maybe you are the glove and the bat. You catch all the quiet between hits and sl or the slide of a shoe across chalk. I am the girl in the outfield. Our son is the roar of the absent crowd, and that makes us a triple play. I am your girl. My hair is a stitch. Come home. Uh, my husband, uh, the Little League coach, is home watching my Little League players, and so this is to all the um, partners and, and uh, family members and friends who make, um, who make time to let their loved ones practice art and to go out and do art as well. So this is uh, Penguin Valentine. Praise the patience of a papa penguin. I don't envy those dark starlit nights with only the occasional blush green current of Borealis across his claws. See how sweetly he holds the egg close to his brood pouch? And I am certain his fierce tenderness would scare even a crab eater seal five times his size. What exactly does a papa penguin register in a nighttime that lasts two whole months? During those days of no sun, does he remember the particular bend of his mate's neck or what hint of yellow near her ears? Does he hunger for a slip of hooked squid, worry about the grand gulp of air he must soon take, the concentration needed to slow down his own heart? I praise the faithfulness, the resolve, the lanceolate feathers shaped like tiny spears, perfect to poke through a cartoon heart to signal Valentine. And Valentine, I sing your praises not because I know you'll wait for me like that, though I know you could if you would. I'm sorry, I know you would if you could. But because, because you never waver. I don't know how you know what direction to look and how to listen for my return, even when my call boils from the floor of the darkest of Antarctic seas. Even if, for now, all we can feel is a cast of red crabs stretching stretching before our path.